Well, good morning to all of you. Uh, my apologies for not being able to address you in German. I wish I could, but uh, it's not one of the languages I speak, uh, unfortunately. Uh, so you will hear me in English. I will try to speak uh, not slowly, but uh, with pause in, in a way that it's easier to understand if you are wishing to follow me in English, but you have the, the simultaneous interpretation as well. So I hope we can communicate uh, very fluently. Well, first of all, thank you very much for Medico International for inviting me to be part of this workshop and uh, delighted also to have taken the, the slot of the initial keynote speech. And uh, I'm going to, to be reflecting with, with you on, on some recent trends that, in my perspective, are undermining the multilateral nature of the World Health Organization and also introducing the risk of undue influence in WHO. And uh, I'll try to, to, to analyze uh, the, the, the real background and implications for some of these issues because I think, unfortunately, we oftentimes are just uh, bombarded by the fashion of some slogans that particularly have to do with the so-called multi-stakeholder partnerships as a very appealing uh, concept that, be, that at the end of the day is not uh, so clear-cut, particularly in terms of legitimacy and in terms of representativeness. So I will try to elaborate on, on those matters and, and I hope uh, we, can, we can reflect collectively on this. Let me see if I'm managing it well. Yes. Well, let me start <coughs> by, well, as, 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 the, as it was mentioned in the introduction, just uh, in terms of background, in my previous incarnation, I worked with WHO. I worked 30 years with WHO, and I have retired from WHO uh, three years ago. So evidently, I will, I will be reflecting on, uh, on an institution where I have spent most of my professional life, not all, but... And uh, I, I will try to, I mean, it's an institution that I, I care for a lot, but at the same time that I would like to see that is preserved going in the right direction and not taking unfortunate shifts in the, in the future. So let's talk a little bit about the evolution of WHO and some of the challenges in today's world. Well, just most of you, if not all of you, know this, but let me just as a background say, 70 years ago, this is uh, an institution that was created as a UN specialized agency for health in 1948. Currently, there are 194 member states, and this is an important element to bear in mind, that collectively decide together with the WHO Secretariat on global health priorities and on the actions for saving lives and improving health. Why do I say this? Because sometimes we tend to forget that WHO, it's, it's, a, it's a body that is constituted by all the member states. It's not just the technical people working in Geneva and the other offices. It is the collective expression of the willingness of 194 member states to go in the direction of protecting health, saving lives, and improving health. With the challenges that this imply, the challenges of reaching consensus among the diversity of 194 member states. It has the headquarters in Geneva, has six regional offices, and it has 151 country offices. This is also not a, a, a I would say, not a minor thing. A, a WHO is one of the UN agencies with heavy presence at country level. And I think uh, it's a, one strength of the, of the World Health Organization, but at the same time, it requires some aggiornamento or bringing it up to date for working effectively. The regional nature of WHO, it's more an issue of continuous debate on the strengths and weaknesses of this regional structure. And I will go into that in a second. But the secretariat of WHO, the technical uh, and administrative staff working for the programs of WHO, is composed by around 7,500 people, uh, 
health experts, support staff stationed in Geneva, the regional offices, and the 151 country offices that WHO has. This map shows you the regional structure of WHO with a region for the Americas, covering from Alaska to Argentina, the region for Europe that uh, covers, it's, it's a region in, in darker tone of blue that is covering uh, Western Europe, Eastern Europe, all the former Soviet republics and includes as well Turkey and Israel. It's, it's the regional composition that it has. It has a regional office for the Eastern Mediterranean that it's, uh, it's in green there, as you can see, with the regional office in Cairo, covering most, not all, Muslim countries in the, in the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, but it covers uh, countries including Pakistan or Afghanistan. Uh, it has the region of Africa in, in yellow with the regional office in Brazzaville, uh, the region of Southeast Asia uh, with the regional office in New Delhi, and the region for the Western Pacific with the regional office in Manila. Having regional structures for WHO, in a way, it's also a strength, but also it has constituted an element of, I would say, divisiveness in approaches or differences in approaches that uh, creates a semi-federal structure that sometimes is not appropriately unified and particularly that has some dual processes of governance in regional committees and in the World Health Assembly. But uh, it's something that one has to look at it with, with a grain of salt uh, because it has uh, elements of strength but it also can constitute an element of weakness for the region. Let's not forget that the constitution agreed upon by all member states uh, gave a main function to WHO in 1948. And this function sometimes is forgotten, and it's a mandate of the member states to act as the directing and coordinating authority of international health or international health work. It's not a technical agency, one more technical agency. It's the body agreed upon by the member states to act as the directing and coordinating authority. And this is what, in many respects, with some recent trends that we have been observing, it's being deteriorating or being weakened in, in, in my perspective. A WHO has a governance structure where there is a World Health Assembly that is the supreme decision-making body that determines the policies, meets once a year uh, with all the 194 member states in Geneva. And it has an executive board that, whose main functions are to give effect to the decisions and policies of the Assembly and advise the World Health Assembly. The executive board is composed of technically qualified, this was the initial idea, I don't think nowadays is exactly that. Now it's more representation of member states in the, uh, elected for three years term and it has a composition of 34 member states. In the past, this executive board was the one electing the director general for WHO, which had some issues of adequate representativeness and legitimacy. For the first time last May, it was the World Health Assembly, the one that elected the director general of WHO. It has been a change in the constitution, and, I mean in the governance structure of WHO. <clears throat> now, uh, some, four, some five years ago, or more, seven years ago, or eight years ago, there was a big discussion and debate among member states and within WHO on the need of changing the course of action of WHO and the way in which WHO was organized. And it was the moment of a so-called WHO reform that uh, very much crystallized in an agenda for reform in 2011. At that time, the member states' views on what uh, was the need for change in WHO can be summarized as follows. Uh, it, it was being stated, well, WHO needs to um, fulfill better its role on global health governance. It's not really doing this acting, this directing and coordinating role of international health. It's currently, it was said by many member states, overextended and is trying to do too much 
covering too many aspects. Uh, needs to respond with greater speed and agility to new challenges, particularly, well, of, of course, emerging public health challenges, but particularly some emerging diseases and epidemics. Uh, member states wanted to be engaged in the process of change and not being exclusively a process driven internally by the Secretariat. That, uh, and this was an interesting thing. Member states said, okay, we need to transform the way in which WHO works, but let's not change the Constitution. Because they didn't want to open Pandora's box, particularly in connection with this regional structure. And this was one of the parameters that, in a way, guided and limited the reform agenda. The, at that time, the financial crisis was also adding urgency to the task. Uh, so there was the pressure and the constraint of the, the economic crisis. Uh, the member states said there has to be a very clear articulation of the roles of WHO in global health, go more for consolidation rather than expansion, and a very critical point, improve the quality of financing more than larger budgets. It's not only a matter of growing in terms of resources, but also the nature of resources, the origin of the resources, and the strings attached to the resources. So this was pretty much the, let's say, the common perception by member states that at the World Health Assembly said, we need a reform of WHO. Then, in a very iterative dialogue between member states and the Secretariat, and not always very easy and smooth dialogue, there was a reform agenda articulated, and pretty much the rationale and purpose of this uh, reform in 2011 was uh, following this, the, 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 or, or, or pursuing the following tenets. Global public health has changed, and this is a very important thing. It has changed dramatically since WHO was established. In, in 1948, when WHO was established, it was the only international body operating on coordinating issues related to public health globally. Well, the global health architecture has changed dramatically, and we have a myriad of actors today, not necessarily always with the representativeness or the legitimacy, but it's a very crowded health architecture. The role of WHO is changing in a global, in rapidly globalizing world, uh, but it ought to continue playing a critical role in global public health. It was accepted that WHO was overextended and needed to focus more on strategic priorities and to, strengthen, and to strengthen its decentralized nature of 150 country offices. Uh, responding effectively and efficiently to the needs of member states evidently require more predictable and sustainable financing for WHO. And here we have one of the major issues. At the beginning in 48, most of the budget of WHO was assessed contributions by the member states. The quota that each member state had to contribute to have WHO operating on the priorities and programs that were established. Today, we have a situation where it is a little over 20% of the budget of WHO coming from these assessed contributions, and close to 80%, over 75%, coming from voluntary contributions. The contributions that are decided by official development aid of some countries, but not as a commitment to contribute to WHO, the contributions coming from philanthropic entities, notably entities such as Gates Foundation, that is having a large piece of the contribution to WHO with the corresponding strings attached, and other sources that are coming from philanthropic and or private uh, financing. So this has changed structurally in a dramatic way with respect to the beginning and the origins of WHO, and it's one of the most critical contradictory elements today for defining the future of WHO. Because at the end of the day, uh, the money is governing the direction, and the money that is coming is coming with the strings attached, and this is constituting over 75% of the funding. So it's very clear that an entity that 
would stick to the original principles would have to have a greater proportion of the financing in assessed contribution, something that is not the case today. At the same time, uh, there has been a recent proliferation in the last 20 years, particularly, of global health initiatives that has created a much greater need for coordination and alignment. Let's remember that in the last 20 years we have seen the creation of UNAIDS, the creation of the Global Fund for AIDS, Tuberculosis and Malaria, the creation of Gavi, the creation of a number of close to 100 partnerships in health from Stop TV, Roll Back Malaria, etc., etc. I can, I can name, I, I could be showing slides and slides of the list. All of them being built in a way in parallel and sometimes du duplicating responsibilities for WHO and undermining the funding that was previously coming to WHO. I'm not saying that these are evil forces. I'm just saying that we have created structurally a problem of proliferation, I will say it a bit later, balkanization in my way, of the forces that deal with international health, creating then a much more difficult environment for WHO. Well, clearly, uh, I mean, this is no rocket science, there was uh, as part of the reform, the need of focusing the core business to address the 21st century health challenges that are faced by the countries, by the world, and uh, aligning better the work of WHO with what WHO does best and with the priorities in the member states. It became very clear that there was a, a need of reforming the financing and the management of WHO to make, make it more functional, more effective, uh, but not to re rest exclusively on the managerial transformations because there was a need of doing the first thing, reform action of the ritual. But also, last but not least, very importantly, in the initial expected outcomes of the 2011 reform, the need of transforming governance to strengthen public health, increasing particularly this role of coordinating authority in international health, increasing the effectiveness of WHO governance and the role of WHO in global health governance, that it was getting very beautiful in many respects. Well, a, a very ambitious uh, program of reform, I work a little bit on this and participated as advisor to the Director General of the Reform, was done organizing in three streams of reform, programmatic, governance, and managerial, broken down into 12 reform areas. It's represented in this diagram. We don't have the time to go into all the details. With a results-based framework, with a very thorough discussion with a, a, the governance structure with the assembly and the, and the, and the executive board. I think the aspiration and the ambition was big, but at the end of the day, the ability to really take it forward and fulfill all the expectations fell a little short. And in my view, a lot of this reform has stagnated and has not produced the changes that had to be produced. There were elements coming in, in the middle, affecting as well the process of reform, the Ebola crisis in, in, in West Africa that uh, shaked uh, WHO in many respects, the most recent campaign and election of a new director general, but one thing, one way or the other, the big impulse at the beginning of the reform uh, stagnated a little bit or decreased a little bit in intensity. If you see this uh, graph where we at that time tried to represent in December 2013, what was the level of progress in each and all of the streams of the reform and the detailed work plan? It shows clearly that in green that only 40% of the reform outputs that had been originally conceived were reached to, or had reached their implementation stage. Particularly issues related to governance reform and issues, some issues associated to the strengthening of the decentralized structure of WHO and of the managerial reforms went much much uh, at a much slower pace 
than what was originally perceived. I think we are now uh, in a situation which, uh, over and above the reform, which pretty much has, I wouldn't say it has died, but has, uh, has not uh, maintained the momentum and the strength at the beginning, accomplished a few things, but didn't go all that far. One of the elements that was central in that reform was the programmatic reform that was crystallized in the 12th general program of work of WHO an agenda of priorities, of strategic priorities, for the, the years of 2012 to 2018, with six leadership priorities that were set out and agreed by all WHO members. But on top of that came, as well, the approval of the Sustainable Development Goals in, uh, by the, by the um, General Assembly of the United Nations. So something that is very important now is the convergence of the particularly the health-related goals contained in goal number three of the Sustainable Development Goals, although also other goals that are affecting health or influencing on health, and the 12th General Program of Work. But we are at this juncture on the verge of the approval of the 13th General Program of Work, which is the agenda for 2019 and 2023. It's going to be discussed in two months in the World Health Assembly. It has been discussed in a special session of the Executive Board and will be as well. Uh, I, I mean, uh, and it, it was discussed as, as well in the January session. And uh, in a way contains a roadmap for WHO to attain the objectives that needs to attain in the next years, but also bring or build the convergence with the Sustainable Development Goals. I, I will refer more in the panel in the third panel when we discuss to some issues of the draft uh, 13 general program of work. I personally find that it, it doesn't have sufficient muscle and specificity. It's a nicely formulated, a bit lofty speech, but not very programmatically and managerially binding. And uh, I think WHO needs at this moment something more granular and more concrete for setting the agenda of work. But I will refer to that a bit later. Currently, the draft general program of work is based on the sustainable development goals, but is uh, structured around three interconnected strategic priorities, uh, achieving universal health coverage, addressing health emergencies, and promoting healthier populations. I mean, as you can see, this is everything and uh, formulated in a, in a very general way. I would like to see one step further in the operationalization of this for the purpose of the agenda of WHO. It has uh, 48, 42 impact framework targets and indicators uh, that are aligned for the most part with the sustainable development goals. And again, still, member states have to go through a final discussion of this in May. And I think uh, there has been a lot of uh, discussion and not necessarily all member states satisfied with the current level of formulation of this general program of work. Fine, this is where we are in terms of processes of the reform of the general programs of work, of the major trends on financing, on issues of governance. But something that I would like to devote some minutes in this keynote speech is what I mentioned at the beginning, these issues that are undermining <coughs> multilateralism in WHO. Granted, true, we have a transformation of the global society. Global society is not the same thing that in 1948. Uh, there is a redistribution of power between the state on one hand, markets, individuals, and civil society on the other, uh, which obviously has to affect a multilateral structure that is par particularly intergovernmental. And this is the case of the UN and is the case of WHO. It's true as well that many global challenges cannot be tackled primarily or exclusively through intergovernmental action and that the action of other sectors of society are absolutely necessary, very especially NGOs, civil society. But we have to find the right way in which this has to project and not a way in which by saying that intergovernmental action falls short can provide just an open door to market forces to dominate 
issues of global health that are not going to be solved by market forces. It's true as well that we are observing more and more, with very contradictory trends in, the, in this regard, that neither the state nor the national boundaries do provide sufficient framework for the mm, character of the action that emerging global challenges require. In a way, we observe a decline of the nation state paradigm, and this is a new reality of globalization. But there are lots of social forces unleashed by globalization. Private sector, civil society, technological innovation, the empowerment of individuals, the dynamic of scientific research, the impact of communication, global migration that many people do not see as the human face of globalization, uh, human face not in the positive sense, of course, by and large, and all of these operate alongside governments and with limits regarding to boundaries. So basically we have new trends, new forces that are not just uh, easy to cope exclusively with national policies or state-based national policies that are going to operate in, uh, in the local arena but also exchanging internationally. We need new types of forces. But there is a paradigm shift in governance. As I was mentioning at the beginning, uh, partnerships have been framed as innovative uh, forms of governance. And very much multi-stakeholder partnerships have been conceived by some as post-sovereign network or hybrid governance. And I'm, I'm quoting here some reflections of Backstrand, thank you, <coughs> who is a, a Swedish author that has uh, reflected uh, very interestingly on the issues of the paradigm shift in government. But I think the, the critical question that uh, in a way we need to ask is, does this rise of global partnerships imply a relocation and diffusion of authority from government to public-private implementation networks? And I think the answer is uh, pretty obvious. It is the case. It is a weakening of the purely intergovernmental covenant and creating new mechanisms. In appearance, well, very appealing because it involves lots of actors, everybody. But who is really influencing these processes? I think we need to look at that and ask ourselves the questions. There is a problem of representation and accountability. To, who, to whom are these in multi-stakeholder partnerships accountable? Who do they represent? Uh, is it always clear what's the legitimacy of the stakeholders? What is the effectiveness of the work that they do? And what is the accountability of these ways of governance? And I think the answer is no, clearly no. It's not always clear. Uh, international partnerships certainly can gain from a clearer linkage with ex existing multilateral institutions and agreements, but for that they need to be framed within the governance structure that can create legitimacy and representativeness. Uh, especially the legitimacy of network governance is questioned very much because the networks escape the traditional models of hierarchical accountability and there is no supranational authority for this. So there, is an, there are issues of power, issues of representation, issues of voice uh, that are critical for the analysis of these new modes of, of uh, network governance. And in many respects, the partnerships networks have been branded as a new form of global governance, and in the case of health, of global health governance, with the potential of bridging the multilateral norms. And local action as well, both the supranational or multilateral norms and the local action, by drawing on a di diverse number of actors in civil society, government, and business. So uh, the legitimacy issues such as public scrutiny, transparency, clear guidelines for monitoring uh, the, the, the progress of these uh, entities, 
are absolutely central to the debate. Uh, and in a more pluralistic governance order, this has to introduce more pluralistic ways of accountability. In many respects, and I'm going to do an oversimplification, but, in many, but, but just for the sake of, of uh, clarity and, and e e exemplifying, a good number of these multi-stakeholder partnerships involving governmental entities, official development aid entities, civil society, and private sector have dismantled the structure of one country, one vote for multilateral decisions that exist in the UN, in WHO, and created more special, particular ways of governing the allocation of funding for some public health priorities that are not giving equal participation to all countries. The countries that are contributing more are having greater power in the decision making, but also multi-stakeholders, multi especially of private nature that have some potential conflict of interest, are also deciding on the priorities. So we, we, we have a contradiction in terms here, in terms of the, of the governance that we are observing. <clears throat> uh, without uh, going too much into the detail, well, the, the questions are, are these partnerships linked to global norms? Are they results-based governance uh, oriented? Are they public, uh, open to public scrutiny, scrutiny? Or have they been more ways of secluding and privatizing some decision making and, let's say, creating boundaries for the multilateral structures for the site? Now, wh why do we, we talk so much about the changing nature of international partnerships? Uh, yes, in many respects, they have also come up as a response to the limit of multilateralism. Multilateralism was not perfect in any means, uh, where particularly intergovernmental diplomacy alone was not able to deal with the pressing problems and the complex dimensions. But again, the rise of these partnerships prompts the question on whether there is a transformation and shift of global governance from sovereign to private authority. And I think this is where citizens, in particular, and then governments representing citizens whenever this is possible, uh, ought to be playing a much more proactive role and not just, if I may say, swallowing the issue of the limitless emergence of partnerships in global health. So, bottom line is, contemporary global governance structures and especially global health architecture structure consist of overlapping and competing authorities, many of them private and some of them hybrid. So we are seeing a real dilution of the representativeness in the decision making. Uh, one could ask, continue, continue asking questions, is the paradigm shift in governance then associated to the changing nature of international multi-stakeholder partnerships? Is it a step forward or is it a conundrum? And does this changing nature correspond to a real transformation of the global society or it's more an attempt to change global society in a more private and less public order. And public doesn't always mean government, but public means citizens. And this is where the issue is. Whatever represents the citizens will continue contributing to a more public order. Whatever departs from the citizens' interest, whether it's in governmental representativeness or civil society organizations, is going to introduce a more private order into global health. Uh, at the same time, we've been observing uh, a decline in official development aid, and especially in its fundamental role as a fundamental, uh, in, in, uh, in its role as a fundamental engine for development. But uh, I don't think we ought to automatically associate decline of ODA and a new structure of, of governance. I think. Uh, this is 
one variable and reality. But the real problem is the balkanization of efforts and not the real complementarity or synergy in global health. It's true, ODA has declined uh, simply from 1990 to 2010. Uh, there was an increase in absolute terms, but not as a proportion of the total flows from the north to the south. Currently, it's about 120 billion. Uh, there has been much greater uh, uh, growth in foreign direct investment. That is the largest flow internationally. Remittances have become the second largest flow, two times bigger than official development aid. Private philanthropic flows are experiencing a considerable growth, currently are about 40 billion. Imagine that current, currently philanthropic flows are one third of official development aid. So this has, of course, changed the composition of matters. But this does not necessarily translate automatically in benefits for the poor. And this new structure of the international flow of, of, uh, of resources, in, especially into the developing world, can be particularly threatening for the poverty eradication and the sustainable development. So I will uh, start trying to wrap up uh, with a couple of, of reflections uh, that mm, I have more, more slides, but I will not go into that. Uh, yes, I think we are observing this balkanization in global health with the dynamic of globalization leading to questioning the prevailing approaches to international health issues and a radical rethinking about the need for global health strategies. But the concept of health as a global public good uh, that transcends the control of individuals uh, maybe has not uh, emerged sufficiently in the agenda and the considerations of global health these days and the global health architecture. Uh, health certainly has become quite intertwined with complex trade and with security challenges. And we have a multiplication and diversification of players. But there are more than 100 global health, public, private partnerships with a diverse diversity of endeavors. Only about 25 involve uh, representatives from both public and private sector on their decision making on the governing bodies. And there are lots of questions about the transaction costs of such atomization. Uh, in my last years in WHO, we did some analysis of of the duplication that existed, particularly with the hosted partnerships in WHO, where they were inside WHO, were in a way subsidized by WHO, but they were having their own separate source of resources, creating parallel undertakings. Uh, let me uh, go to a couple of final points. Uh, there is much to discuss about this, and I think in the, in the coming two panels we will be touching upon this. But uh, part of the issue within this governance debate has been the engagement with non-state actors. And uh, the, some of the colleagues here in the, in the audience um, participated in this debate when I was still at WHO. Um, we were trying to go in the direction of a very clear cut definition of how to engage with non-state actors, not to threaten the governance structure, and to avoid conflict of interest. Uh, WHO used to have very detailed processes for conflict of interest in relation to staff, but not in relation to entities in interacting with WHO. I think very unfortunately, in my perspective, uh, things derive into a framework, the FENSA, that not necessarily has taken the, the steps that would have been um, desirable for ensuring conflict of interest. And I think we still have there a pending issue in the life of WHO, in the governance of WHO, where, uh, in, in my perspective, a much more stringent and thorough approach has to be developed to ensure that there is absolute firewall 
in terms of the possibility of conflict of interest, of private interest, with the normative and policy function of WHO. And again, this, uh, well, we could be spending hours on this. This implies risk management in the corporate engagement, particularly with the private sector or the philanthropic sector. And it is something that, in my view, is not uh, uh, yet adequately developed in the case of WHO. Well, let me just go to, to the very final point to leave some, some time for, for, the, for questions, if possible. Um, a little bit on, on the way ahead uh, and some possibilities. I think, uh, well, WHO has all these structural problems that I have talked about, the big structural problem of the sources of the financing, the big issue of the competing and parallel undertakings of the partnerships and the dual governance that this establishes, the, the issue of adapting to the new realities and challenges in public health. So that demands a very, I would say, thorough and aggressive way of conducting business in WHO in the future. I'm not seeing it fully in the agenda of the 13th General Program of Work. And I hope the international debate can go more in that direction. But if I could summarize some of the, the major developments that I think WHO should follow in the coming years, I could say the following. WHO needs to deepen the reforms that were initiated in 2011, these reforms that have stagnated in the last couple of years. And uh, it shouldn't be dropped or it shouldn't be abandoned not only by the WHO Secretariat, but, uh, but also by the member states. But I have to be very, very frank. I do not see sufficient appetite in member states to deepen these reforms. Let's put it that way. And it's an understatement. <laughs> uh, at the same time, uh, it's clear, and this became very clear uh, when this was approved a couple of years ago, WHO cannot just go in parallel to another exercise of policy definition, which is the Sustainable Development Goals. It has to be a clear roadmap for the attainment of the health-related Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, I think the 13th General Program of Work is attempting to start this discussion, but in my view, it needs a much more thorough debate in that regard. I have, in, in general, a, I would say, a, a observation or criticism with respect to sustainable development goals. It has been great to agree on aspirational goals to attain in multiple sectors. But there has been no effective discussion in the international forum on the way to achieve them, on the political economy to achieve the sustainable development goals. And they are not going to happen by magic that all of a sudden in 2030 we will reach this. So, Again, in the health arena, we need to discuss how do we get there. We have lots of goals in, or, or, or targets in goal number three, but I see very little international debate on, well, what does it really mean to attain this and that sustainable development goal? It's very clear that, in my perspective, we need to reestablish WHO leadership role in the global health architecture and the global health governance. To, to play that role that is mandated by the Constitution. Or if not, I think we need to revise the institution and the Constitution. But if we are going to be consistent with what was created and mandated, this needs to be uh, reestablished. We need to resolve the, in my view, conundrum of the dual regional and global governance processes. We have too many parallel layers sometimes with contradiction and there is room for improvement and rationalization. Another dimension is that it's important to sort out the enormous duplications, parallel governance, and competition of resources between WHO and the myriad of multi-stakeholder partnerships. I wish we could have member states going to WHO with this clear agenda in mind, stating in the fora that we cannot possibly continue perpetuating this dual governance and competition of resources and parallel undertakings. But it is not the case. You don't see it. Because oftentimes, as well, the member states that are more involved in 
voluntary contributions prefer the mechanism of the multi-stakeholder partnership to have greater control on the agenda and more strings attached on the agenda. Not to mention philanthropy and private uh, sector. We need to halt the tendency for the deterioration of the core funding of WHO through assessed contributions uh, and the pervasive dominance of voluntary contributions. If there is no recovery in the public agreed upon contribution of all member states to sustain global public undertakings, we are going to have a weakened WHO and a weakened structure. And you can imagine that there is again no appetite on member states of increasing the quota contribution, the assessed contribution, except one or two countries that have volunteered to increase the, country, uh, the quota contributions. There is for years a tendency, particularly in the larger contributors, of zero growth in the assessed contribution. But zero growth with growth of the responsibilities mean that you have to finance with other sources, and those other sources tend to be sources that have strings attached. We uh, need to consolidate much more the development of global public goods for health, things that are common to all with common action, common funding, and common governance. And this is, uh, for me, the real debate in international health or global health in the coming years, how to select the critical global public goods where we need a, for that matter, multilateral approach. And, last but not least, get right the engagement with non-state actors, ensuring no conflict of interest, creating a, an appropriate firewalling, but also, as we tried at the beginning, which I, I still think has to be built in much greater degree, increasing the engagement of those non-state actors that have a true public interest where there is more citizens' representation and, and representativeness. And I think that still needs to be built in terms of governance, but in terms of action, collaboration, and joint policy development. So, in a nutshell, this is a, a, a very quick uh, uh, overview of the major trends, of some of the threats of the multilateralism, of the threats of the undue influence, and of the absolute need of deepening all the possibilities for WHO to be the world's coordinating authority in international health. So thank you very much, and I'll be happy to answer some questions. Sir.